We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Sit Rep. Um, it is that time of the week again for your, I don't know, your your Sit Rep resistance for the week. Um, I'm just jumping on here uh, to do a little bit of a live intro just to catch everybody up and let them know what's going on because some of you guys may have seen uh, the beginning of our Decoding the Devil series and some of you may have not. So just want to let you know as we're progressing forward, we're actually going to, it's been kind of my my goal is to complete the Decoding the Devil series and we got about three episodes in. And I have a lot more topics to talk about. So we actually have a gap in time now where we can actually complete the rest of this Decoding the Devil series. So I thought, what better way um, to start this off than to go back to the first parts and reload them because they weren't loaded up to the Take on the World TV. So there will be a live chat right here, um, but the the video will be uh, pre-recorded for at least the next episode or two um, that we have coming up. So. Uh, just you guys can catch up and uh, enjoy the show, and we've got some really cool stuff coming up for the future episodes. So guys, stick around, uh, be in the chat, and uh, get that all filled up, and we're going to talk about a lot of really cool things. Um, so guys, enjoy. Um, this the, My guest uh, was uh, uh, Andy, uh, or everybody knows him as CCMC in the chat, and we had a really good discussion talking about hell, the fact of fiction. So without further ado, we'll see you guys. Oh, welcome, welcome, everybody. everybody. I am uh, Aaron Sampson, and we've got one of my buddies, Andrew Denny, with us tonight. We're doing things a little bit different. We're kind of doing a, a little surprise show um, on a Friday night here, and I'm hoping everything launches up. So we're kind of simultaneously testing the stream for next week, as well as launching um, a new part of uh, a new series in SITREP called Decoding the Devil. And uh, this is going to be the first part of that series. And, uh, I thought like, there wasn't anybody else I could think of better to have come on than, than Andy. What's going on, Andy? How you doing, buddy? And not a whole lot. I'm glad you called. Yeah. We're glad to have you on here. Of course, uh, <laughs> Ian's Ian is normally with us when we do this, but um, being, this was a, a quick show and, and all this, uh, Ian is at home. So what's up, Ian? I hope you're enjoying uh, Shabbat with your family tonight. And, uh, so how, how are you doing, Andy? Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, that's all right. Uh, I'm doing. I'm doing good. I uh, had a pretty crazy week. I don't know if you knew. I had knee surgery Monday. I was out for a few days from work, and then went back yesterday and worked today. So. Oh man, yeah, you jumped right back in. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy. We're definitely happy to have you with us. And this is a um, it's a pretty crazy topic. And I'll kind of intro my thoughts on it a little bit. Um, this. God's been kind of like, you know, tugging on me to work on this series called Decoding the Devil. And, um, you know, I've been trying and there's a lot of studying, a lot of going into it. And I didn't know exactly where to start off. And I've been talking about this hell concept um, for a long time and my problems that I have with the the idea of hell. Um, and I know this is going to probably spur some controversy. And I just ask that if you guys are listening to the show, that uh, you hear hear us out and do your own um, study, um, because there's a lot of tradition of um, RCC, the Roman Catholic Church, that is embedded in this topic. And for the Christian truthers that are out there, um, I see a lot of uh, people who point out the pagan in everything. And I've been mm -hmm. super surprised that no one has really, um, that, 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 that the whole concept of hell has kind of skirted the attack of the pagan onslaught, you know, so, um, yeah. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of people posting about <laughs> Valentine's day right now about the pagan origins of Valentine's day. And, um, I, I'm just like, you know, this, this topic right here has been one of the most divisive topics in Christianity and has done most of the damage of, um, what Roman Ro what Rome 
the Catholic, uh, uh, their kind of output on how that they were, they were ruling and taking, you know, take to how they took power was based solely on the idea of scaring people with the idea of hell. And, yeah. and um, so that, that is, I mean, that's something I want to touch on too, but this has migrated into evangelical Christian. And what really kind of spurred me to want to do this tonight is I know we talk about uh, Isaiah Salvador and I, I love his ministry and the stuff that he's been doing um, so far. I, I don't find any real true fault in what he's doing. He's doing what God has asked him to do. And I, and I enjoy that, but he, he put out a video today that was talking about um, hell and, you know, there's, three to 5,000 people that, that were watching his video live and then countless number of other people were watching it, you know, after it was published and the comments and stuff that, that he was saying just reflected the Roman Catholic and evangelical version of, of, um, this, this concept of hell. And, uh, I really think that there needs to be voices out there that are talking some sense into this fantastical, um, like, thing that Satan has put into the, the minds of Christians, because it's not a biblical concept. There is a biblical concept of sin, of death, of Sheol, and it's been twisted by cherry picking of scriptures um, to give Satan this dualistic persona that is that has brought the level of God, of Yah, down to the level of Satan and elevated Satan to the level of Yah. Do you think that's that's a fair assumption? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's funny how many different words that mean different things in other languages were translated to the English word hell. So they they pretty much could take whatever they want and uh, just totally change the meaning and to just to make people afraid. Yeah. And like, like I was telling you earlier, this doctrine, I mean, it's if you look at a lot of these doctrines, a lot of them are fear based and uh and I believe that's why it's so important to for the people who are coming up with these doctrines. They, I mean, control has been <laughs> the when you're dealing with the elites, no matter who they are, fear is the way that you can control people. So, yeah, and I just hate that the way that it makes Christians look. Uh, you know, this is the reason a lot of people don't want to come to Christ, or a lot of atheists. They will, you know, they they reason in their minds that a loving God wouldn't. Uh, send people to hell so they could be tormented and tortured forever. Yeah, that's, so. that's exactly right. That's that with my conversations with many atheists and agnostics, they start out with the, I don't understand a God who uh, I don't decide to, to worship this deity. And he punished in my 70 years or hundred years of life. And he punishes me for all of eternity. And that, that, that becomes very damaging for people in their, because to understand the father is to get to know who the father is and know the love of the father. And I think the church for a long time has taken anybody that they didn't agree with. They didn't understand. I mean, when you look at the history of Christianity and you look at Roman Catholicism versus the, um, uh, the, the, uh, Oh, what is it? The, the, the Protestants and the Protestants versus Roman Catholics, they both condemned each other to hell. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> they had these conversations. Oh, you yeah. believe this, so you're going to hell, or you believe this, so you're going to hell. And it, to me, when you understand and have a relationship with the Father, you guys under you understand that He cares for His creation, He loves His creation, and He gives every opportunity for His creation. But it is the, 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 the problem of fallen man that we choose to walk in as our own gods and, and instead of worshiping one above us. So I guess, I guess I want to start out. I want to pose a question to everybody in the chat. Um, one, if you guys are, you guys are in the chat, um, do you believe in a fire and brimstone hell? If you, if yes, no, I'm not going to, we're not going to condemn anybody or anything like that. Just want to know where you stand at the start of this. And then I'll ask again when we end. So that's the first question I want to pose to the chat. Do you believe in a fire and brimstone hell with Satan and demons with pitchforks and stuff like that? You know, your cartoony Christian version of hell. Um, and then the second question is, and I'll pose this question because this is, this is the, the crux of my entire argument for this. Is not an eternity in hell still eternal life? Do you guys agree with that? Because being eternally tormented or punished in hell, is that or is that not eternal life? Um, because we have a whole litany of scriptures that, that talk about God giving eternal life and how you attain eternal life. And I'll start out by saying, from my own opinion, 
when I read these scriptures, not out of context, not cherry picking them, there is only one way to gain eternal life. And that is through the Messiah. And that is through the mm -hmm. walk that God has laid out for us. So yeah. I want to start out. Um, I'll let you see if you have anything to go to, to add to that real quick. I've got to jump on and look something up real quick. Sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing multiple well, tasks right now. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, you know, the first time that I heard the word um, annihilation, uh, not the first time I heard that word, but in regard to this, it was from uh, the, like I told you earlier, it was the Unitarian community. Um, this understanding of hell versus annihilation is very big among uh, that theological setting. And this was probably, I think it was 2018, I was at a, a little mini conference and I had not even thought about this before, but one of the speakers, he went up. I thought I thought this was all going to be a conference about God hit theology and Christology. This guy gets up and he starts talking about uh, there's not a real hell, at least not the way you think. And totally caught me off guard. But the things he showed me made so much sense. And I have not spent an extensive amount of time studying this doctrine but it made so much sense and what i retained from that conference and i took home with me over the past few years i just see it when i'm reading through the scriptures it's a very easy um doctrine or teaching to understand and and uh and uh, to to go along with when you're reading the bible um so i, I really don't feel like it does take that much uh intense studying to understand it all right, I'll um, launch up with a couple of these scriptures. I'm going to fire these off at you guys real quick. I wish I had the ability to share because I'm running all of this stuff at the same time. I get both of my monitors are completely full. So I'll read them off to you and I'll give you the where they're at. And you guys can go back and check these out. Um, so the first one is I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. That's John 10, 28 through 30. That's Jesus speaking right there. Next one. For those who find me, find life and receive favor from the Lord. Proverbs 8, 35. Next one is, and the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. That's first Peter five and 10. Uh, the next one is uh, the word of, or the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. That's first John two seventeen. Uh, the next one is, so we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Second Corinthians four 18. Uh, the next one is, uh, and this is the testimony God has given us eternal life and his life is his son. First John five 10. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The most quoted biblical scripture in the New Testament, John three sixteen. 16. Um, in that right there, it says that if we believe in him, we are granted eternal life. Um, for, our, for our light and uh, momentary troubles are achieved for us as an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So there's the eternal glory. Uh, 2 Corinthians four seventeen. Uh, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. First John five thirteen. 13, uh, search me God and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there are any offenses, offensive ways in me and lead me to the way everlasting Psalms 139, 23 through 24. Um, this is one that I'll, I will, I will come back to, um, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 23. Uh, and I'll, I'll do one or two more here. Now, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is eternal life, that mm. we know God and his son. John 17, 3. Whosoever believeth in, believeth in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on them. John three thirty six. So I think, I mean, and I, I have probably 20 more of them, but that alone is more than two or three witnesses in my eyes that believing in the father, believing in the son and walking in the ways everlasting is the eternal life that God grants to us. 
And um, I know a lot of people want to to argue from a perspective that uh, humans were created eternally. And I have to disagree with that because we can go all the way back to the garden and understand that God did not create mankind to be eternal. We were, we were to survive off of the tree of life and we continue to survive off um, on the new, in the new Jerusalem off of the tree of life. That is what sustains us and keeps us um, alive in our new bodies or in our, uh, you know, our new creation or whatever is through the, the eternal life granted by the tree of life. So anything you want to add to that? I'm sorry. No, I'm just, you're all the stuff you're saying. It's great. I think it's a really great point that when you're talking about, um, even when you're in hell, according to the popular doctrine of hell, you're still alive. That's not death. You, the, the Bible talks about being dead, no more dead. <laughs> but, um, if your soul is still, if there is a, a sense of awareness, then you're not dead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I, I guess we should start, let's see where, uh, cause in, in Hebrew tradition, they didn't have any kind of concept of hell. What they understood was the, the concept of, of a Sheol. Um, mm-hmm. and we can break that down. I know that there are three in the Hebrew and Greek, there are three words that relate to the place of the dead. And then there is one that relates to the trappings, the place, the prison of the fallen angels. And that's only used twice in the Bible. And that we'll talk, talk about that one first. That one is, uh, Tartarus and Tartarus. Um, we could go in a lot into the Greek of why they chose to use that term Tartarus, because in the Greek mythology, they believed in the, uh, the, the, uh, the Titans and the Titans place was to be locked away in Tartarus. And they used that because they were, they were predominantly speaking to, to Greek, you know, converts in the new Testament. Mm-hmm. And so they had this understanding of who the gods you know, the Zeus and, you know, these, the Greco Roman pantheon of gods and who the Titans were, which were the ones that spawned those, uh, which, you know, for most of us that are watching, we have this understanding of, of the fallen angels and their children and stuff like that. Um, so it varied that, that the whole concept, uh, is a Jewish understanding that we have kind of lost that concept for, for most of Christianity until recently. It's, it's kind of been brought to our light through uh, like a Nokian text and things like that. Am I right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's, it, like you're saying, you know, it's the Hebrew words, it's the Greek words. I'll tell you something funny. I had bought this book. Oh, it's been a while. Actually, I think my wife owned this book when we started dating. So over 10 years, um, it was written by a guy named Bill Weiss. He also wrote 23 Minutes in Hell, where he describes an outer body experience, and he feels like his soul literally went to hell for 23 minutes. And um, But everything he was writing about is consistent with popular, the popular hell doctrine. What's funny about this book, Hell, um, is that he brings out all of the Hebrew. He brings out all of the Greek. He talks about Tartarus, Sheol, Gehenna. But instead of understanding the Bible with those words, how they were written and in their context, he is saying that those words were used to describe um, how bad hell could be. So he's basically interpreting the Bible backwards from an English, <laughs> you know, Western perspective uh, and, and going backwards. You know, that's that's a pretty common mistake that people make. Yeah. Well, let's look into, we'll start with, um, so we, we kind of know the history of Tartarus, um, where that, that was the Greek, like we said, that was where the Titans were locked away. And we see that represented in the Bible by where the watchers were locked away. Um, it's mentioned, you know, in the Anakian text, it says that they were locked away in this, this place under the rocks, they were buried. And then in, uh, in the new Testament, it talks about the punishment that, that the, even the angels of heaven, like were trembling, because of the punishment that happened to these wayward angels that went down, you know, and, and, you know, whatever they did, it doesn't really kind of, I think, I think it's implied that the, the reader already knows what mm-hmm. those, and we've kind of lost that as in modern Christianity until recently. I know most of the people that are in the live chat, they understand the concept of the Nephilim now because, but 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even though the Bible talked about giants all the time, we didn't have, we had lost the whole understanding of what the giants represented, who were their mm-hmm. parents, all of that kind of stuff. So we understand Tartarus. Let's look at Gehenna. Um, for those that don't know, Gehenna was a, um, it, it's, 
it's thought to be a small valley just outside of Jerusalem. Um, it was where uh, the initially some of the kings of Judah sacrificed their children by fire. Um, thereafter, it was deemed to be cursed in rabbinic uh, literature. Gehenna is also the, what, is, what is commonly referred to as the destination of the wicked. And uh, Jesus talks about Gehenna, um, and he says it, what, it, what it represented at the time that Jesus walked on the earth. Um, it was a trash heap, basically, outside of the walls of Jerusalem. And it was where all of the refuse and all of the trash was thrown and burned. And it was described, I think, I think literally, and I've, a lot of people have taken that as the, the everlasting fire and the, 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 the worms, it's actually maggots, which maggots are a life cycle of flies, which you go to any junkyard, you're going to see lots of flies. So if you're looking at just the, you know, the, the maggots of the, the carcasses and flesh and trash and feces and all that stuff that they're throwing over there, there is going to be a never ending cycle of maggots and which are v- visible on the surface. So I think it can be very well described as a literal interpretation of what Jesus was saying for the simple fact that you have to understand the burial practices of the Jews at the time. If you were a traditional Jew at the time of Jesus walking the earth, you were given a proper burial. Um, And Jesus even had to deal with this when he was crucified about the whole who's he was given a burial tomb and that tomb was only there for a short time. Jerusalem wasn't very big and they had a lot of dead people over the, you know, thousands of years. So they had tombs in, in the, the burial practice that they would put you in for a certain amount of years. And then somebody would go and collect your bones and then relocate you. And then that was like your family tomb. You were basically to go in there and until you devolved down into just a pile of bones and they would collect those and those would be buried off site somewhere else or put in a uh, family, you know, kind of mausoleum type thing. Mm-hmm. So as a Jew, that would been, that would have been your, your burial. And we see this practice being done all the way back into Abraham. I mean, there's all of these things about, you know, Abraham's body and Moses's body and the lands where Sarah was buried and all that. It was very important. The burial practice was very important to them. And they kept and maintained that all the way up until modern times. And what Jesus was talking about was if you are a believer, you will be buried in this process like uh, like you're, you're, you're commonly aware of, right. And then there is yeah. the idea of a Gentile. If the Gentile who did not believe in Hebrew traditions, they died in the city. They threw you out with a the refuge. They literally threw you in Gehenna in the trash because yeah. you, you did not represent or did not deserve a holy burial is the way that the, the, the Jews at the time believed. So I think that was literally what he was describing was the casting away the death. And they would have understood this at the time the ceasing to exist and the being thrown into the refuse, the trash, right? He was trying to explain to them, you know, follow this and you will have everlasting life. If you don't, you get thrown away like the garbage. I mean, does that, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I liken it to the dump, the, the city dump or, you know, um, that's basically what you're describing is basically like ancient cremation. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, Gahina was a big one for me and I pretty much came to the same conclusion as you, what you're describing. Um, I, I listened to several different teachers, watched videos and they all kind of brought out the same dynamic, uh, about, about, uh, the, the outskirts of the town and, uh, and, uh, that's where they would take their garbage. Um, so it was just a comparison and he was just, you know, and, and people take that so far, um, it's translators, namely translators took it so far enough. They just found something that they could use and, uh, to go along with the hell doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, again, with that, that concept though, since we're speaking of Jesus and what he said about it, um, there is another misnomer that a lot of people uh, jump on the bandwagon of, and that is understanding the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Now, every time Jesus spoke um, in parable, he literally said, this is a story or this is a parable. The, this, the, the scripture very well lays out when he yeah. is speaking in code and when he's speaking uh, something that's literal. When he speaks of the story of Lazarus and the rich man, there is no hint that that is a parable. So there is an assumption in Christianity that God is speaking in a parable to kind of demystify the idea of death. But I think it is very literal uh, what he was talking about at the time. Now, I think things changed. And this 
This can be debatable of what happens to a Christian after death, but I'm not really concerned with that because we live, you know, God has promised us eternal life. So whether you rest in Sheol for a short period of time or whether you stand at the glory seat of God, that really to me is, is, is illiterate or illiterate is irrelevant at this point. Um, uh, but we can, I mean, we can talk about that later, but what happens to the unbeliever is a different story. And what happens before mm-hmm. Jesus actually goes down and takes the keys of death and brings, you know, some of the, uh, the, the prophets and Kings and stuff back up with him, which they, you know, there was evidence that he, there were, there were thousands of other people who saw resurrected at the same time that Jesus did. So he did some, when he died and went into Sheol, I believe what he did is he went to David and Abraham and all those who were in the bosom, who were in Sheol in paradise. And he went down there and he said who he was, that they had been waiting for the, the Mashiach. And he told them yeah. who he was and they followed him up. They were like, I personally believe they were the first fruits. They were the first resurrection. Um, and that's, you know, that's not fully studied out. Don't say thus saith Aaron Sampson. That's just what right. I believe. Um, <clears throat> but when he went down there, it may have changed the aspect of where Christians don't go to Sheol. Um, they go straight to heaven. I, I do know there is an argument that a lot of people use is what Paul speaks about. They say, so uh, they say, what is it? How do they, how do they say it? They say, um, to be out of the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. And it's completely yeah. misquoted because Paul does mm-hmm. not say that. He says, I would rather be out of the body and in the presence of the Lord than basically be in the body that I'm in, but I'm here with you. So he's, he's not saying it as a fact of this is how things are. This is how the kingdom is. He's saying, this is what I would prefer. I would much rather not be here. I would rather be with the father, but he has me here to work with you is literally what he was saying. So that is another thing that we use um, out of context. So just wanted to throw that out there. So I'm not, not saying that there isn't a, a, an immediate place to go for Christians. I'm really discussing the idea and concept of hell. Um, so what Jesus talks about when we're talking about the, um, the non parable of Lazarus and the rich man, we have an understanding that the, the, the person who was suffering in that instance, you know, was this man who was in this desolate place. He was in this place of, uh, that he was thirsty and he, and he was fully aware of what was happening on earth and what his life was before then. Now this wasn't fire and brimstones and demons poking and stabbing him and eternal punishment like the, the, the RCC and evangelical church wants to teach. Mm-hmm. He was in a desolate place. And this is from the word, the, the mouth of our Messiah himself, speaking of what he knew and understood. And this person was concerned about his family, please don't let them come down here. I wish I would have known. I wish I would have known. And I think the greatest thing about that parable, not parable, sorry, um, that, that story is that at the end of that, he says to him, the angel says to him, says, even if you resurrected and go and tell your family, they wouldn't believe you. Right. So just that it was, it was a, it was a pretext to even the Messiah resurrecting. Mm-hmm. Like it was really cool. I, I like, there's so much I could dissect on that story, but I don't want to, to, to focus on that too much, but understanding that what Jesus talks about the afterlife for somebody who is a non-believer doesn't sound anything like what the RCC and evangelical hell looks like. Yeah. And, uh, for me, Sheol was a, a huge key that really unlocked a lot. Um, you know, like I said, there are a lot of different words, but it's, it's that place, Sheol, that really, um, got things spinning in my mind. Jonah, the story of Jonah, oh, if, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I was a kid, I pictured, um, a, a guy that stayed alive the whole time in the belly of the whale. I, I remember even seeing a picture, um, of Jonah sitting on a bucket and a parrot on his shoulder. And they were teaching the story about Jonah. But it's like if you read that and you understand Sheol um, and you understand what uh, Christ was talking about when he said uh, it'll be like the sign of Jonah, you understand that he was dead. He Jonah describes death. If you're in the chat right now, uh, you're next. uh, Read the book of Jonah. Uh, with this in mind, what we're talking about, you'll, you'll get something completely different. Um, yeah. Cause it says, it says that the, uh, the seaweeds wrapped around his neck and mm-hmm. then he went down below the earth and into, into the mouth of Sheol. Like it's describing his descent into death. Yeah. 
And it's, yeah, and we, uh, yeah, we always had this picture of Jonah sitting in the belly of this whale, like uh, Pinocchio's uh, Geppetto, right? You know, like when yeah. he's sitting in the whale and he's, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. but when we actually read the text, it literally is talking about his death and he was resurrected to go back and do what he was, yeah. what God asked him to do. And then I always, when I've talked about that before, you notice that there isn't much after the story of Jonah, like after he saves Nineveh, he complains about some tree that dies and God chastises him. And then you don't hear any more about Jonah because God only needed Jonah. He resurrected Jonah for Nineveh. And that was all he needed him for at, after that point. I believe Jonah went back to be with the father after that, because, you know, he, that was all he was, he was used for, you know, he was, he was accredited a hundred thousand, you know, souls or whatever to, to his, so, you know, he's, he's, he, he put his work in, but in the same aspect, God didn't need to have Jonah anymore. Jonah did what he did. Um, that's a really, it's a really cool story because I like the story of Jonah because it, it shows that regardless of our decisions, if God asks you to do something, you're going to do it. And it <laughs> may, he may add some people to your list because all the people on the boat were saved as well as the people of Nineveh. So because they threw him off and then, <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. So um, right. they started worshiping the God of Jonah because uh, they were trying to appease him. So it's a very interesting story. I, I do enjoy that. But you bring up a good point with that about him descending into Sheol. So, yeah. so Sheol is another, another topic and, uh, otherwise known as Abraham's bosom or paradise in other, in other texts. And that is a place where the dead went, um, immediately after, I mean, the, the breakdown of Hebrew, it just means to be in the ground. Literally. It just, it just saying a place of rest in the ground. And, you know, that's what we know commonly as the grave, um, and what I find funny is we use the terminology still to this day, rest in peace, RIP. And that goes back centuries. Um, and it literally is meaning rest in peace in the Lord, right? Or rest in peace in the ground. <laughs> so that idea that, you know, we, we just immediately go to hell or go to heaven is not really a concept that, that hasn't, wasn't in the Christian kind of theology until recent years. Um, yeah. So the, so we, we know that the, those four different discussions of, uh, Sheol, Gehenna, um, and what's the see? Was there another one? I think, oh, Hades. Hades is the uh, the Greek terminology mm -hmm. that, that is. Oh yeah. Name. And um, that goes on to the uh, the pagan aspect that I want to talk about. This, of course, um, Hades is. Uh, I don't think it's a. I think it's used in the Greek in the New Testament, but is not described in the Old Testament as that. Um, but again, you have to understand with the Greek language, um, just like the Hebrew language uses um, a lot of its words have L or Yah in them because they, they, they honored God with the words that they spoke. Well, Greek was the exact opposite. Greek honored their God. Well, I guess it wasn't the opposite, but it honored the wrong, the other gods. The Greek language honored all of their deities through their language and the things that they said and the, the, the titles and stuff that they use, the names like Hel Helena is, is a, has hell mm -hmm. in it. Um, uh, Helios is another God, which is funny. Helios has hell in it, but he's also the God of eternal fire. He is the God of the yeah. sun. So Helios is another example. Um, Hades is, is not only a, uh, place, but a deity in Gre Greco Roman mythology. You have hell who is a deity, um, in North mythology, H E L, um, who is a God of the underworld, um, slash Hades, hell, whatever. Um, so I could go on. I mean, every single one of these, um, uh, set is a God of the underworld in Egyptian mythology. Mm -hmm. Every single one of these has this deity who is over the, the dead. So you have a deity over the living and a deity over the dead. And this is where I have a big problem is the dualistic nature of the concept of heaven and hell, because it brings God down to the level of Satan and Satan to the level of God. And it gives them a yin yang persona where one is equal to the other. And biblically, we know that that is not even close to the case. That's probably the most unbiblical mm -hmm. thing as Christians we, tr we preach and talk about because God is omnipotent and omnipresent and, and the most powerful creator of all things. And Satan is a worm who crawls on his belly, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now, not to say that, that Satan does not ha deserve some form of uh, understanding of who he is, and you can't play with Satan, because Jesus himself didn't. Jesus called uh, Hasatan both the Lord and the God of this world, but not yeah. of hell. He, he never said that he was the Lord and God of hell, right? He is, he is the prince of the, and the power of the air, 
Yeah, he runs what is happening on this earth only because we gave we gave submission the power that God gave us in the garden. We gave over that power to Hasatan, right? So, so controller of a of a land or whatever that is uh, compar or, uh, comparable or equal to the Father. He his kingdom is is by far outnumbered by the kingdom of God, and and if God willed which he doesn't because he needs Satan to fulfill what, what has been prophesied. If he will, though, he could snap Satan out of, exi out of existence anytime he wanted to. Um, and we see that later on in the text, which we'll cover when we get into where some of this stuff comes from in Revelation. Um, but Satan is not equal to the Father by any means. There is no equality in that. Um, it, the, the best explanation I've ever heard actually came from my father because he had a kind of flash of the 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 difference between God and uh, Satan. And he said he, he got this kind of vision of a chessboard. And God was not only all the pieces or the king on one side, but he was all the pieces on one side, all the pieces on the other side, the table and the room that the chessboard was being played in and the person dictating the chess pieces. But Satan was just one pawn. So the, the, yeah. the, the difference between God and, and Satan is so great. And we to think that they have an equality is uh, is it's beyond me. And and to me it is it goes into dualism. To dualism. And if you guys aren't aren't familiar with dualism, there's tons of pagan religions which practice dualistic natures, where they have a head or chieftain, say like Zeus, and then on the other end you have Hades, and they both control territories. Zeus had the Mount uh, Mount Olympus, and Hades had Hades, the place of the undead, and they were equally matched. And biblically, we don't see that by any means. Is that correct, Andy? Yeah, that, that is. Um, I was going to say something. Uh, when you were talking about uh, how how small uh, Satan is in comparison to the thing, it just uh, a lot of times we hear scriptures, different Bible verses, and we don't think about how significant they really are. But that the verse came to mind, <clears throat> greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We are greater than Satan. Um, so I'm sorry, that didn't answer your question. That was just something I was thinking. No, that's, but that's absolutely about. correct. Because the power and authority of the Messiah, um, it was relinquished onto us. We, we, through mm -hmm. us, we, are, we, we stand. It's like we have a signet ring. If you guys are familiar with kings or anything like that, they, they had a signet ring of power that basically, when, if they stamp something, it said, thus saith the king. And sometimes in place of them or in lieu of that king, he would hand that signet ring over to somebody else or he would mark a letter or something and say, this is the, 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 the sovereign word of the king and you delivering it with my signet means that this word stands whether I'm there or not saying it. And in that same aspect, this is what the Messiah did for us is we carry that sealed signet, that mark that says we are given the power and authority of the Messiah while we're on this earth. That is what the the relinquish or the the, the yeah the relinquishing of the Holy Spirit to, to reside in each one of us um, gives us that power to tread on serpents to to be able to take on demonic entities to to have that authority because we mm -hmm. wouldn't have that authority ourselves. So I, I, through I can't the remember what um, there there was a letter um, it, I can't remember if it was Paul but they call it the earnest of our inheritance or one translation says the seal is basically a seal the holy ghost so yeah yeah um so we'll talk <clears throat> a little bit of, we'll, we'll kind of because we've, we've gotten that far as far as kind of breaking down some of these different things we'll st let's step into opinion a little bit so where do we where do we think and see that this kind of transition from having this biblical understanding and and why having this biblical Hebrew understanding of what happened to us after, you know, death, burial, and resurrection. Cause I mean, I've studied the church fathers. I understand what the first century, what their perception on things were. And they didn't talk a whole lot about unbelievers as much as they did. What was, ha you know, what was called for us for believers. <clears throat> but where do you think we, we, we saw this drastic change where this, this theology came into place and, and why it was brought into this place? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I haven't really studied the history behind it. Um, how the church, like mainstream Christianity, got to where we are. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, just like, I mean, who would be the culprit? Uh, I think we've already said it a couple of times, but maybe you can expand on some of the other times. 
um, the culprit who who instituted this concept of hell. And I've got to grab a drink real quick. I'll be right back. So I'll let That's you. That's all right. Drink. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going to bring in a side note when he was talking about Helios. Um, it just made me think of how this does play into the cosmology, the heliocentric model. So um, if you understand it, a little bit about hell and, and that doctrine, then you can also learn a lot um, by looking at the cosmology as well. Side note. Yeah. <laughs> um, Did you have something so, else? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, well, everything points back to the Roman Catholic Church. You know, so I don't know if that's really the answer or where you were headed with that. Um, yeah, I was, I was kind of seeing that, that, I mean, theologies and stuff like that um, led, uh, there, were, there were Gnostic theologies that led mm -hmm. to this kind of concept of the dualistic nature of God and, and the enemy. Um, but I think uh, the RCC with, with, that's just how Rome functioned. When Rome conquered an area, they, ab they absorbed the, the, the cultures and the, the religions of those who were underneath them. And we even saw that with Christianity. I mean, I think most people who are in the chat or who are listening right now understand concepts like Mary and Jesus. The statues are just a, uh, you know, kind of dressed up version of Isis and Osiris. Yeah. You know, so we, we saw that all they do is they just slap a paint coat on everything and then call it something else. So we saw that kind of with a lot of the, 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 the influx of Christianity into Roman Catholicism. They just kind of took this the names off of stuff and called it something different. And I think that originated um, probably with the best intent for the most part, like to try to make the ease from paganism, uh, the, the Greco Roman paganism into Christianity mm -hmm. a little bit easier. But I mean, the failure in the, the, that we didn't recognize that or turn that away over thousands of years, um, which we, I mean, we did in a manner of speaking with Protestantism and, and all of that, but it took a long time, but that has to do a lot with, what Rome did with the power that they were get, that they that they grabbed. So um, as as it, you know, Rome changed from being a a uh, military power to a religious power. They had to figure out how to maintain control over the people without an army, and the best way to do that was through the religious aspect that they were supporting mm -hmm. and to change that concept to put fear into people because Rome put fear into people. If you saw a legion marching towards your city, you learned a whole lot of respect for Rome because they will destroy and wipe out your entire village. Um, mm. So they had to kind of transition from a Roman army because after the fall of, of Rome, Rome was basically spread too thin. The Black Plague came through. I mean, there was so many different things. They were being attacked by the Goths and the, uh, or the busy Goths, the, um, the Astrogoths, they were kind of hitting them from one front and you had the, um, the Mongolians were hitting them from another. So they were just getting demolished from, and, and there was also Islam was coming into Spain and mm -hmm. hitting their coastal, the coastal lines of Italy. So they were just kind of getting decimated from all different sides. Um, so once they lost their army because they were spread too thin, they had to maintain power. And the best way that I, I've seen that they were able to do so is through this idea of, uh, of do what we say or you will be punished. And that was how Rome transitioned from the understandings we had before. They just took that theology of, of this Sheol and they made it a place of torment. And where I really saw the shift in history uh, was in the Middle Ages. Um, they, they became very strict on things and the church was like, do you know what we say uh, you know, leading up into the dark ages. Um, mm -hmm. And it shifted around the time. I mean, we had things, uh, the, the, the whole, uh, there was this kind of subculture in the art and in the, uh, the, 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 the literature and stuff of this kind of more macabre understanding of, of religion. I mean, sicknesses would come through and it was automatically, it was demons and spirits and things like that. They, they really kind of shifted um, in their, in the middle ages and their understanding of, of things because we went for a long time. There was a, a great, uh, hand in hand, like kind of, uh, coincidence with the, the scientific people who were, who were coming up and religion up until a certain point. And then it went like, you know, science went into alchemy and mysticism and religion went into yeah. this really dark macabre time. And this spawned out of that. We get a lot of, um, you can go look at, look in the dark ages of their, their kind of, uh, their, uh, 
what is it? They're, they're like paintings and even um, Dante's Inferno. Uh, those, those all kind of started like getting really dark. And I think Dante's Inferno was one of those that we get a huge idea of this kind of hell concept and the seven layers and the punishment because he was i mean there was a whole lot of like and when you go through and read donna's inferno about people being ripped in half and i mean depending on your sin you know you had different mm-hmm. snakes and vipers and you know demons consuming you i mean none of that is biblical you won't find anything like that in the biblical text but we have that concept that still has has kind of traveled through thousand a thousand years now of christianity from that time till now so what do you think about that, that kind of that concept, that transition? Yeah. And I, I, after giving it a little thought, I would wonder if we saw a major turn when the English Bible was, when, when it was translated into English and that just gives for opportunity for translators to do what they want, put their own bias into the text. Um, so I guess I would be interested to, if I, you know, did that kind of study just to see, what may have changed, you know, and I'm not fluent in any of the, the previous languages, uh, but um, I would suspect that once Bible started becoming distributed more and, and they, uh, that English word hell, I, I think that's what it all goes <laughs> back to. Well, I know, know, I know pre 1811, uh, the 1811 Bible, there was never once a mention of hell in the text. So you can go, <laughs> if you can find a pre 1811 um, Bible, you will not find hell in the translation it is sheol or gehenna or tartarus um yeah yeah so what what i do understand from that is you gotta i mean you gotta think the the rcc controlled all of the the, you know the the the, their their parishioners by by reading the text in latin and basically telling people Mm -hmm. through their their bishops and their their priests you know if somebody came to them about something you know you have to look at they, they had to go confess their sins and they were, you know, they had this relationship with the, the priest or the bishop or whatever. Uh-huh. They didn't have a relationship directly with God. So they had already interjected that whole, you know, we are the, the space between you and God and you do what we say, or this is your punishment. Um, and they went as far as, I mean, the, the, the Borgia Pope and all that, man, they did some crazy stuff where they were, they were like having charging people for pre-crimes basically. <laughs> if, if you wanted to escape eternal punishment or, or whatever, yeah. you could pay for your sins in advance. So, you know, they were, they were definitely milking it for everything it was worth. And, uh, but, but the, the scary thing was, was, you know, the, they were the power that was, that was claiming that they were in place of the divinity of God. So they were mm-hmm. literally saying, we are put here by God in this time, which, you know, I mean, I do believe that God utilized, they were there for a time, just like Nebuchadnezzar was supposed to be over in control of uh, Israel for a time. You know, God right. allows these things to happen for reasons. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, their 2000 years reign of Christianity or whatever was mm-hmm. not supposed to be. Um, because, you know, ba- or, uh, not Babylon, but Rome has played a big part in a lot of prophecy all throughout time. So um, what we're, what I do see, though, is that the Roman Catholic Church, you that concept of hell to not only scare the parishioners in to pay them money and finance their, you know, their, their kind of accumulation of wealth and their armies and whatever, but they also used it to control not only the, 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 the masses, the peasants, but the kings and queens. If you go look at history um, of, of like the French reigns, the, the uh, English reigns, the Scottish reigns, which it's funny because to bring that up, because we've been watching this show called Reign, um, and you know, we've seen a couple of other different shows that are kind of talking about these different time periods and stuff. And it's just crazy to see how many times these kings and stuff bring up Rome. You know, it's like we have to appease uh-huh. Rome or Rome will dethrone us or they won't approve of my, you know, divorce for my wife or whatever. Like they were, I mean, the kings of, of the, the middle or the, the uh, European continent during this time for, for a long time, they, 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 they had to do what Rome said. And they were, they were terrified of the power that Rome had over them, even though they didn't have necessarily a large standing army. So, um. Yeah, I, I think I think that was that was the biggest thing that we've seen is this um, you misuse of, of this idea and this fear mm-hmm. of God. And honestly, I mean, if you guys think about it, if, if the church, if the modern Christian church 
for the last thousand years or whatever since since Protestant, Protestantism escaped the the control of the RCC. If, if if we had taught the love of God and the relationship and the walk, walking hell, I mean, how many people are going because they think it's going to get them a get out of jail free card, right? I right. mean, how many people don't understand the the walk and the love and the the friendship and and the the compassion that the Father has just because they've been told by their church that yeah. if you don't do what I say, you're going to hell. <clears throat> that's a scary, no, that's, th scary thing. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And um, I think, you know, coming out of the hell mindset, out of the mainstream uh, Christianity mindset over into Torah, that has allowed me to uh, uh, understand that aspect of God a lot more. So, yeah, I love what you're saying. Now, uh, just for clarification, did I was trying to follow when you were talking about the 18, or were you, did you mean the 1611 KJV? Yes. Yeah, so, 1611. I, I think. Okay. Yeah. I, cause I mean, I have a version of it and I went and looked this up and there, there, the, the, the hell was not uh, instituted until the 18, uh, the 1611 uh, KJV. So pre 1611 yeah. there, there was not any mention of hell in the text. Yeah. Cool. I'm glad you told me that. That's neat too. Um, there was one thing I wanted to bring up. Because I saw Bowman eighty two mention this a few little while ago was the lake of fire. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. Did, did you have anything on that? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and I will. There, there. So there, there are a couple of. So we'll go get to one of the misnomers of this by talking about this. So there is a lake of fire that that things are thrown into, right? We, we see it in Revelation um, where it says that uh, early on in Revelation where, where the, this after the rain, the, the, the stepping up and reign of the, the Antichrist and the, um, the uh, false prophet and those who take mm -hmm. the mark, it says that they are all thrown into the lake of fire and they are, they are tormented eternally. So there is one instance where those specific entities are thrown into the lake of fire. Now this has to go a lot along with, and people have taken that and said, see, if you guys are taking the mark, you're going to burn in hell. Right. I agree with that. Absolutely. But what we don't understand fully is what the mark actually represents. I personally believe it's going to be something genetically introduced that will share genetic blood. Um, we just like we saw Nimrod was becoming a gibberine, something that he did, whether through some practice or some, uh, some kind of genetic alteration, it changed his body where he was no longer resurrectable. Now, I could go into the whole thing about how I believe that Nimrod is the Antichrist resurrected or brought back, you know, spiritually because he is a wandering spirit. I guess that, that we have yeah. to talk about Enoch, right? Enoch talks because uh, we have this idea of these demons, right? The understanding of what the, you know, has changed were the concept of demons. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little Bible study for everybody in here. I want somebody, if you can, in the next few minutes or whatever, until the show's over, Try and find me somewhere where it says a third of the angels were cast out of heaven with Satan. Find me one place in the Bible. Because th that's another misnomer that we have in Christianity was that mm. Satan took a third of the angels with him when he fell. There's only one place it's ever mentioned, and it is not in the sense that he tricked the angels to fall with him. It's in Revelations, I think, 12. Don't quote me on that. But it says that the dragon swooped, sweeped his tail and that a third of the the stars fell to the earth. And of course, stars and angels are synonymous with each other. Does not mean that, I mean, that text alone has been the one that has led people to believe that Satan convinced a third of the angels to fall with him. I don't believe that that's true anywhere in the text. What it does say is that Satan and his angels um, go and try to make war with God. But now that we have the Enochian text with, with first Enoch, we understand who those angels are. They're the fallen watchers, the 200 watcher class angels who sat on Mount Hermon and conspired with Azazel or Hasatan to yeah. turn away from God and go and, and mate with men and women or mate with women pr primarily and create the, what we call the Nephilim or the children of the, the fallen 
And those became the punishment in Enoch states that those became the evil spirits that wandered the earth, seeking after the lusts of their flesh, flesh eternally. Those were half angel, half human hybrids, which were never, humans were meant to resurrect. Angels were meant to be eternal. So to have a combination of the two of those meant that they could not die, but they could not resurrect, which left them on the plane of earth. So what we deal with demonically is not a legion or multiple billions of angels that fell with Satan. That's BS lie that of course, Satan, along with his, I, I have my own place yeah. to rule is not in the text. Okay. We have an understanding now who the heads of Satan are and his, his adversaries, the, the Satans, right? They are the, the, the fallen watchers who are in opposition or rebellion to the father and the one mm -hmm. who convinced them to do it, who didn't participate, but he convinced yeah. them to do it. Um, and then the, the legion of the demons, the lesser demons that are wandering this earth are human entities, half human, half angel hybrids who seek for bodies to live their vicarious sins through because they can't do it themselves anymore. They're evil wandering spirits. So now when we talk about the lake of fire, who gets thrown into the lake of fire? Well, there is a black awakening that is coming that the, the beasts of the abyss, the pit are released and they go after those who don't have the mark of Yah. Right. I believe in this sense, and we don't have a full understanding of, of the prophecy yet because it hasn't come to pass, but I believe there is this uh, instance where the mark is taken and whatever it is that, that, that it makes you who you are as a soul or spirit is taken over by the, one of these beings that wants to have this, you know, to live out vicariously. Right. It, because it says that those people become evil con constantly. Right. When it says that when, when Jesus says, um, you know, what is the sign of, of your return or whatever. He's like, you know, it's, it's going to be like as of the days of Noah. And it says as the day, the time of the days of Noah, it says they, their hearts were continually evil and they, they, you know, they seek destruction and all this other stuff. Right. So we're going to see that again. And the only way that's going to happen is I believe all of those spirits that have been seeking bodies somehow will get bodies. And those who give into that through the mark of the beast are thrown into the lake of fire. Um, same thing with the, the, the Antichrist, which I believe, again, is a Nimrod figure, a reincarnated or rehashed spirit of Nimrod. And then the false prophet, mm -hmm. which could be a number of different things. It could even be Semiramis, who was the queen of, of false oh, religion. Yeah. So um, it could be a resurrected spirit of her. We don't we don't know. But Satan is utilizing them, these tools to uh, to try and, and bring ruin to mankind before the Messiah returns. But they are all thrown into the lake of fire, and it says that they are eternally punished. But there is a lot of other texts that people use in the Bible that says an eternal fire, and then it's assumed that that eternal fire, because even in some of the texts, when you go look at that, it says eternal punishment, but it was actually speaking of the fire and not the punishment. Um, and the yeah. eternal is a, is a Greek word called aeon, and it does not mean forever. The aeon means for a dedicated period of time in the Greek. So even though it, it may be for a short while, I believe that that, that, that torment for them is, is only short lived as well, because after the millennial reign, Satan's thrown into it. And then the whole world and the heavens and the earth are all destroyed and restored. So it may mm -hmm. not be an eternity for them either, but I mean, that's a different discussion, but what we need to understand is just because it says eternal, eternal hellfire or, uh, you know, torment eternally in the fire it's that, that word is describing the fire eternally and not the punishment. So, um, well, go ahead. I'll let you speak real quick. Um, I got to find something for you. All right. Well, um, I actually learned about that aspect of it a little differently, but, um, as sure, far no, as, yeah, let, uh, <laughs> you go ahead. Well, and speak it's just a different, it's just a different perspective of looking at it. I didn't do a word study on that but i kind of looked at that as though it meant the consequences would be eternal it's like you're not the annihilation would last forever i mean well yes. you know what i mean no i do agree with that for those people who choose not but the, what i'm talking about is for the watchers the, or the, the fallen angels the uh those who take the mark the the false prophet and the, okay we're back on that yeah they are the ones that are that it says eternally it's there's a separation in the language those ones are supposed to be tormented for an eon for a, you know, for a time period. Um, but for anybody okay. else who's thrown in there and we go later on into revelations, it says they're cast into lake of fire. It says both Hades, um, death, uh, I think Satan and, uh, basically I think it was, it was Satan, 
the I'd have to I'm gonna have to look the passage up to be 100. percent But it's Satan, hell, right. and the uh, and death are all thrown into the lake of fire, and then it talks about the second death, right? It says those who partake in the uh, in uh, I'm just gonna have to pull it up because <laughs> it's gonna throw all me right. Well, I didn't mean to get to that, that point up, yet. So while you're looking that up, I wanted to you were talking about this earlier. I'm gonna put a link in the in the chat, and this is uh, Ken Heiderbeck did uh, Life in the Blood. And he brought out a few things that I had not really thought about um, how, uh, you know, describing more how life is in the blood. And, and it, I, I wish I could describe it the way he was talking about. But actually, you know, for like people who drink blood and things like that and all of these vaccines, different things, um, how it's literally taking life of other people or parts of their soul. Even I can't remember how he described it, but um, that that is a good video that really I felt like helped fill in some of my questions so i'm i'm putting that in the in the chat <laughs> all right i'll pull this up real quick because i was going back to that passage you were talking about um revelations 21 8 says but the cowardly the unbelieving the vile the murderers the sexual or moral those who practice magic arts the adulterers and the liars they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur this is the second death right so it's not saying mm. this is the first death and we have to go back and we have to realize what what was what was what was Jesus or what was the the gospel saying when it says in John three sixteen it says that God so, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that if you believe in him you shall not perish he's not talking about the first death he's speaking of the second death that's where you get the eternal life right but those who are cowardly unbelieving vile murderers sexually immoral those who practice magic arts the adulterers all liars they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur this is the second death it doesn't say God is going to torture you for all of eternity. It's saying you were going to die. You were going to cease to exist. So you're going to stand in front of the throne room of God, never wanting to spend any time with God. He is a just and fair God. And he looks at you and says, you, I gave you 80 years on the earth and you didn't want to spend a single day with me. So I'm going to give you what you wanted and you will have an eternity without me and you will yeah. cease to exist right now. Going back to the lake of fire, uh, because I want to, I want to touch on that because there is, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Let's see. I got to pull it back up here again. Do you have anything you want to add while I'm. No, I got off the, the lake of fire and totally forgot. So. <laughs> that's right. I'm going to bounce all over the place, but that's how I, how I work here. Um, now I... I'm trying to find the, uh, the passage. Cause there's one time. Um, and I think it's in Daniel, uh, where he has a vision of the, of the heavens. And he, uh, sees, uh, Let's see if I can find it here. And I mean, you'll you'll see this theme scattered throughout the Bible. There's there's often one that is brought up, and when you talk about cosmology, but I think it was David who wrote about ascending up to the heavens and descending to the lower parts of the earth. I I, I believe he was talking about Sheol. But so, I mean, just in random passages, you know, you, you'll see this thing. Yeah. Uh. All right. So um, I found part of it. It's Daniel seven, Daniel seven, nine it says, as I looked, the thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and his hair on his head was white like wool and his throne was a flaming with fire and his wheels and its wheels were ablaze, were all ablaze. Um, that's one. I know there's, there's a couple of others. So we know that there, uh, there's another passage that says that there are, uh, the, the candlesticks that are in front of him that are ablaze and a fire. There's so many of these, uh, these kind of ideas that there are flaming fire in, in God's throne room. It wouldn't be too far of a stretch to just say, you know, like it reminds me of the old, uh, the, the, you know, you go to see the king. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. You're echoing them. Okay. Um, but you go, you go see the King and the King has the trap door and you, you just fall into the, you know, into the jail or whatever. I, I kind of get that vision where it's like you go up before the, the throne room of God and it's like, okay, you know, here's your punishment. And he just sweeps you off into the fire. Um, to how I've tried to explain this to some of my atheists and agnostic friends. Um, and I apologize to my, uh, my FE brothers and stuff. I'm going to use this in a heliocentric, uh, description cause I have to with them. Um, but let's say I took you in a NASA space shuttle up to the sun 
and we just took the little arm thing, that little thing that takes the satellites out supposedly. And I grabbed you and I flung you into the sun. All right. Your spirit is energy. Well, the sun, as, as science tells us, is a giant ball of plasma. All right. And it has a gravitational pull that nothing can escape. So if I flipped you into the sun from the little NASA spaceship, right. Um, and this is a fictional situation, just like it really is fictional. But so we flipped, <laughs> flipped you into the sun, right. You would, your, the gravitational pull would immediately suck you in. Your body would be immediately destroyed. And because you are energy and that is a plasma ball, there is nothing, not even energy escapes that you would become absorbed into the energy and cease to exist. Okay. That's how I explain it to my atheist and agnostic friends. Right. So that same kind of concept is what God will do to you in the eternal fire that is underneath his throne. Right. All he has to do is just say, this is my judgment and plop, you're gone. Right now, of course, there is a different punishment. We cannot confuse the two of those for those fallen angels and their Nephilim children and those who participate in taking the mark. So it makes you unresurrectable. And when God is cleansing the earth of all of this, just like he did, he cleansed the earth during the time of Noah um, of all of the Nephilim, right? That was said that all of the flesh was tainted. They had literally tainted millions of people, animals, and all kinds of stuff all over the world before the flood. And it was wiped out by water. There's prophecy that, that both the, uh, I think it's Anakian prophecy that the earth would be destroyed twice, once by water and once by fire. The second time is to wipe out all the rest of this Nephilim. It is a complete destruction. It is going to be their, their undoing, right? Is the finalization that, that death, that Satan and that, uh, hell itself is all thrown into lake of fire and destroyed. So, and that term hell that's thrown in there is Sheol. It's not, it's not Mm -hmm. hell. It's been translated as hell. So it makes a lot more sense when you look at it and say that death, the carrier of death, right? He who Jesus took the keys of death, you know, keys from, he gets thrown into the lake of fire. That uh, Sheol gets thrown into the lake of fire, and that Hasatan gets thrown into the lake of fire, and they're destroyed. Right? That's that's yeah. the end goal that God wants to clean up all the mess, and He wants to start all over again. As far as the rest of the people, I I personally think that the reason why Christians hang on to this so much goes to one of actually God's or Jesus's parables is the parable of the. Um, uh, see the, uh, the parable of the, how oh man, which one was it? Uh, the workers of the field. Sorry, man, I'm, I'm spacing it today. So it, it's in human nature for God to ask us to do something. And then we expect that God asks the same thing of other people. And when they don't do it, there should be some kind of punishment, right? That's kind of our human nature. How, you know, God's going to ask me to do this. So you must do it too. Well, we see in the parable of the workers of the field that some were called to work at eight hours. Some were called to work, you know, five hours. Some were called to work three hours. Some were called to work one hour. And God said, my grace is just like the payment. You know, I paid all of you equally. And here you are, the ones that had to work eight hours, you're getting paid last because I chose to pay you last and you're murmuring and complaining, right? We have to watch out about wishing these kind of concepts on people because God may not ask the same thing from every single person. He knows what we, what we need and what we deal with and we struggle with. So I think that the reason why this has been perpetuated for so long is because it's in human nature for, we want punishment for those who don't do what we do. Yeah. And no, that's good. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of the brother of the prodigal son's brother and his bad attitude but, you know, I, this is one of the reasons that I, I really want to always have the prayer that, that Christ prayed on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, you know. And I, I always want to check myself and make sure that that is my attitude towards other people, even though it is. Like you said, it's human nature to <laughs> want to see the bad happening to somebody. Yeah. You're going to get what you deserve, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I see how that works in the ministry. I guess one of my, the biggest problems I've had, I used to have the debates with the, uh, the, you know, the guys that stood on the corner with the carrying their cross. I mean, the, the fire is there. Like they, they want to do what's right, but they were, were misled by the church. You know, they're out there preaching to a bunch of drunk yeah. people walking the street saying, if you don't turn from your drunken ways, you're going to burn in hell. Like how many people did you actually save? Because what Jesus would have done. And this is what I told one guy one time. I said, Jesus would have been right down the street, opening the door for people and saying, God bless you you know, or, or whatever, you know what I'm saying? He would have been available. And when somebody said, well, why are you saying that? He would have been like, here, come here, let me go talk to you. I want to tell you about some things. He didn't stand on a, on a pulpit and, and condemn people. 
right? I mean, he knew what yeah. the outcome was. And he knew and understood what God was asking of him. He wasn't trying to, the, the people he condemned were the religious elite. The people he called the, yeah. the worst yeah. names were the ones who were doing yeah. exactly this. They were the ones that were stoning people in the streets because you didn't follow their religious rules, right? So, you know, that's what we need. We, we need to have some, some kind of comprehension of this concept of hell. And we've got, we've got to kind of dispel this myth because it's hurting people, not only in the body, but potential people who are coming to the body to use this concept that the church has done for so long has, has pushed so many people away and I, and it's dangerous. And, you know, I, I just want people to search this out and to, to look into this more. I know I'm I was trying to look at some of the comments and it seems like a lot of the people were on board and under already understood a lot of these topics, mm -hmm. but I wanted to put this out because we have to be, you know, man, I don't want to go stand in front of God and him go, you know what you did good here, here and here. But, um, you know, when you were preaching about hell and you scared all of these people away, <laughs> you cost me a thousand people, you know, like, oh, I, man, man I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, I don't want to be yeah. in that position. Right. I want to teach the love of God, the mercy of God and all of those, those, the relationship and the walk of God and not teach the fear of a destruction of, or a place of, you know, eternal torment. Because to me, it's out of character I, of God. Yeah, man, that's good. And uh, gosh, I hate to even think about uh, when you start thinking about souls you could have won but didn't because of something you did. Oh, man, that's one of the worst <laughs> feelings in the world. Yeah, it um, is. Hey, I want to bring up one more passage. One more passage. I'm putting it here in the uh, chat. Well, Gosh, the, the text is too long, but maybe it'll go in two different ones. This is the, the Second Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9. This was really one of the only ones that I was having trouble dealing with when I was coming to this understanding. Um, so I don't know if this was one that you would want to speak on. Yeah, was, I mean, now when I read it, I look at it like understanding that it's a uh, okay, let me read it. It says, uh, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So, yeah, if you're hearing hell preach from the pulpit and then you go to that verse, you're not going to think anything other than, hey, this is the eternal hell they're talking about. Um, what was that at again? Second Thessalonians one verses eight and nine. Okay, one. Sorry. And I don't have my uh my my lexicon. This oh, is not fine. the, the right out out for that. Yeah. Um, that because I think this is one of those instances where it's talking about the eternal aspect of it is as applied mm -hmm. to the fire. Um, but let, I want to verify and make sure here. So chapter one, eight, nine, but yeah, um, anybody else that wants to, if you, if you think you have a passage that supports the idea of hell, put it up in the, in the chat so we can, we can kind of go over it because I want to dispel as many of these as I can and give you guys the tools, um, to, to speak with people about this. This may save somebody's relationship with the father. I mean, mm -hmm. cause I don't know how many times I've talked to people and I'm like, Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm like, oh, I can't do that with that God that wants to throw everybody in hell for nothing. And I'm like, well, well, wait a second. Like, you know, where did you get this idea? Because I think your perception of God is based on non-biblical truths. And then this opens up a door to be able to talk yeah. to people about the, the, an actual relationship with the God without the fear of being stuck in the butt by little red demons. Right. So mm -hmm. let me pull this up real quick. Cause I want to, want to get, uh, this up on the okay so i want to read it in context too say uh god is just he will pay back the troubles to those who trouble you and grieve uh, is that the right one or did i go back you said uh, Th first thessalonian 1 8 through 9 right go or second back. thessalonian okay second all right now, this, i mean actually this kind of agrees with what so second thessalonians i'll start back a, a couple of verses here so we kind of get it in context it says, sure. therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your preservance and faith and the persecutions and trials you were enduring. All of this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back the troubles to those who trouble you. He's 
saying that, you know, that what goes around comes around. Basically, you, you know, you persecute my Christians, you will be persecuted um, and give relief to those who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in a blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord from glory or from, they will be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So I'm going to go down to the Hebrew here and see what this says. Okay. So it says they, uh, it's in the Greek, sorry, not the Hebrew. They will suffer the penalty of eternal destruction. So it's not even eternal hellfire. It's eternal yeah. eon. And then destruction is Olithron, uh, means ruin, doom, destruction, death from the primary ol, Olami, uh, ruin, death, or punishment. So um, I'll read it all here. So they will suffer the penalty of eternal destruction separated from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. So there you go. <laughs> Broken down yeah. in, in the Greek is actually it's talking about destruction again. So what mm. was what it tells you in, in a different version of it, it says uh, he punishes those who will not know God and do not obey his gospel. Oh, in the new living translation, it says in flaming fire bringeth judgment on those who do not know God and those that refuse to refuse to obey the good news of the Lord of Jesus. Uh, English standard says yeah. in flaming fire inflict vengeance on those who, and see when you actually go to the Hebrew, it doesn't even say anything about fire. Okay. Or in the Greek, I'm sorry. Cause in the Greek, there's not even okay. a mention of fire. Oh, say okay. I'm sorry. In the lexicon, it says okay. In blazing fire, he will inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Okay. So in a blazing fire, let's read what that is. We know what the vengeance is, but yeah. um, so blazing is a flame. Um, it's logos and fire. So it's, yeah, it's literally just saying a flame of fire. So, but I think we see that in the return of the Messiah when, you know, he mm -hmm. wipes out nations. Like, um, and we know that there are several vials and, and, and things that are dropped on the, on the world that basically wipe out entire populations, you know? Yeah. So we, we can, we can understand this, the, the fire, the fire, the heat of the sun, lightning, strife, trials, eternal fire. Our primary word is fire, uh, pyre in the, uh, the Greek. Um, hey. Yeah, uh, looks like Brandon Miller threw out a verse, Matthew 10, 28. It looks like this one is pro annihilation or uh, from what I'm getting from his comment. So maybe we can read that one. Yeah. That's uh Matthew 10, 28. Let me pull it up real quick. Yeah. Sorry guys. I wish I could share it on my screen and make this a little bit easier, but uh, let's do. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Again, yeah, we used this earlier. I think he uh, he he found the the passage. Do not be afraid of those who oh. kill the body, but can kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body. And in that is, uh, I'll go to the Greek real quick because in some of them it says in hell. So um, let me pull that up in the actual Greek here. Some of the translations completely change that part here. Okay. Cause I think it's in Gehenna is what it said in the original text. Oh yeah. That's, that's that same context then, wasn't it? Yeah. The, the Gehenna context. Okay. It yeah. Says, and do not be, yeah. And, uh, and do not be afraid of those kill, uh, of those killing the body and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and body in Gehenna. Um, and that is gotcha. actually, again, like it's, it, thrown into the, 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 the burning trash heap and you're destroyed. It's not saying we're going to throw you into that trash heap to be tormented forever. It literally is telling you, <laughs> you are going to be destroyed. Um, let's go down to the Greek. I just want to double check it and make sure. Okay. Uh, so in the Greek it says, uh, but cannot, uh, I didn't go back far enough. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear the one who can destroy uh, from Apio, the base of Mithilio, to destroy fully, literally or figuratively, both the soul and the body in Ge uh, Gehenna. The Hebrew origin, the Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, a, a valley of Jerusalem, as the name for a place of everlasting punishment. So, of course, that's added context. But, yeah, it's in Gehenna is where that says that. Okay. So, yeah, no, that's a good passage. I do like that one. And, you know, we, we have to understand these concepts that, 
you know, God is not like this schizophrenic being that wants to, you know, wipe out entire populations. The reason why he gave his son, I mean, it's talked about in, 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 John three sixteen, right? He gave his son because he wanted to give mankind the, the opportunity yeah. to um, have everlasting life with him. So it's not like he's a, he's an unjust God who's going to sit there and just punish people without any reason. I mean, think about the person who's in China right now living in, you know, some rural part of China who, uh, you know, where, where China is persecuting Christians and he has never He's tried to live the best life he could, but he's never even heard the name Jesus. Is it, is it a fair and just God who will sentence him to an eternal damnation because he didn't know? There's actually a passage at the very, very end of your Bible that talks about the earth giving up from the seas and the land, all the people. This after the millennial reign, after Satan is done away with. Um, it says that there is a great white throne judgment where the earth gives up all of its dead, um, both from the sea and both from land. And each one of those people are gauged and judged by what was written on their hearts. So even though, even after all of this, they miss, of course, they miss the whole uh, millennial reign, all of that kind of stuff, the resurrection, they miss all of that stuff. But by the end, only God knows. And this is one of the things that I have to, I have to have this discussion with people is because only God knows the heart of those people and the actions of those people. So I'm not saying that you can live an entire life without Jesus and then you still get to make it into heaven. Heaven does have layers. And there are people who are going to make it into heaven who you never thought were going to because God wrote the truth in their heart and they tried to follow it the best they could. And this, yeah. this goes out to all those people who never got the opportunity to know who Jesus was. Just like the people before Jesus, he gave them the opportunity when he went into Sheol there is an opportunity for those people who never got to know Jesus. Now, this is not for those who blatantly deny the, the, who Christ is, right? Because God has a record of every single thing. There's not just the book of life. There are books of all kinds of stuff written up there. God, it's, you know, it's, it's written into the language that to show that God knows everything and only God can decide who is going to make it and who's not. Do you want me to find that passage for you? So, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. If you have it handy, it's, uh, I think, Revelation 22, 24. Okay. Or just find it and put it in the chat. Oh, I was actually funny. flipping through something else. 22, 12, maybe? Let's see. Let's see. Oh, man, I, do not, I don't like Bible Gateway. Come on, get out of here. All right. I gotta figure out where this is at. All right. I'm sorry. I, I um, anything in the chat here? Let's see, Matthew. I, I didn't get to watch the chat, guys. I'm sorry. Let's see. I'm tired to abolish. Can you see the chat over there? All right. I flipped off the chat for a minute <laughs> to, I was grabbing this book. I'm doing everything while I'm holding a phone. So <laughs> you're, you're kind of like stuck like me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see if I can find this real quick. I wish I should have, I should have grabbed my Bible too, rather than try to do this. It would have been okay. easy, it would be easier to this. find it. I was flipping through that book, Secrets from Beyond the Grave by Perry Stone. I was talking about this earlier to you, mm -hmm. which he actually, for a mainstream author, he actually brings out quite a bit. Um, he even talks about Azazel and Rephaim and a whole bunch of different things uh, about uh, the dead and the uh, underworld. And he was talking about the sea giving up the dead and things like that. And... Uh, even to the point where there was, he was talking about an explorer who, some deep divers who had all reported that they had felt like they heard uh, chains from underneath uh, the uh, the water in the ocean somewhere. And he was talking about like gateways to Sheol, hmm. which I thought was interesting. I don't know. Um, I can't remember it well enough to speak on it, but. Yeah, I mean, um, in, the, in the occult and in uh in the pagan uh, traditions all over the world, there were caves and, and, or, um, I mean, even like some Mayan 
mountainsides. They built these giant doorways that, that don't lead anywhere, you know, and they were called like the entrance or the gateway. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have the river Styx, which leads to yeah. the place of the dead. They had these concepts. And I believe these concepts came from uh, either passageways because Enoch, remember the story of Enoch, Enoch yeah. just strolls down to the punishment place of the, the watchers. And he's just hanging out, having conversations with them. Like, you know, like the, he knew where they were at and how to get to him and how to talk to him, you know? Wow. So those, those may have been a place and there are other, there are other ideas, you know, that uh, post flood or pre flood that they had some kind of underground tab, or, you know, uh, these underground like cities and stuff like that, that that's where mm -hmm. the giants were. And, you know, that, that may have been the, that kind of concept too, that, that, that was linked to those people. But um, I think for most of our history, um, there have been people who have been trying to reach and talk to the watchers. Remember, we're going to talk more about this when we go deeper into the, 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 the Satans and the adversaries and what each of their characteristics are. The Satan never, never actually uh, taught, man the truth he lies to man right so who are the illuminated ones who are the ones that the illuminati go to to get information right i, I like how rob skiba talks about it when he when he says we went from uh, horse and buggy for two thousand years to planes trains and automobiles in less than 60 years i mean what happened there and and when we do the math i believe that the watchers were released and our governments and things you want to talk about the flat earth and the government the covering you know of the government's uh, of, of that. Well, think if they had, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they, they had these deep underground military bases with watchers hanging out in them, teaching them all this crazy technology. I mean, we, that could, that could be a, a possibility too. How would we know? We're just now uncovering the, uh, the flat earth conspiracy. What about the, uh, the bunker conspiracy with the, the, uh, you know, the angels in it. And that's another thing to, to yeah. consider. These aren't angels. The, these, these watchers aren't angels per se. Right. They were angels, but they shed their first estate enough that they could uh, they could mate with men and women or women primarily. But um, then their children mated with men and women, whatever. But anyways, that's what. So they're they're They are um, they are in a physical body, whether they're larger than us or not. We have no idea whether they look like reptilians or whatever. They became into a form or a body um, when they shed their first estate that that made them be able to replicate with humans. And yeah. they were also eternal, which means they could not die. They were put in, in, in shackles and chains and, and put underneath rocks. Um, but they were eternal. They did not die during that process. And they were chained in there for four, 70 times 70 generations, 4,900 years. We in our mythology, um, in our human mythology, over uh, thousands of years of paganism, always have these concepts of immortals. You know, these, these, these deities, these gods, these, whatever, I mean, even vampire mythology, right? These blood sucking cannibalistic people who live forever. Yep. Where do we think that this, these mythologies come from? These come from right. actual beings who walk this earth, right. And, and, or were under the earth, whatever. Um, so I, th I think we need to kind of, we need to shift our focus now that we have more information, more deeper study and language, you know, of understanding the Greek, the, the Hebrew, we can start looking into this stuff. We have these keys, man. The Nephilim was a huge thing that unlocked all of this for me. So was flat earth because honestly, um, when you understand flat earth and you understand that it's a biblical cosmology of a dome with God sitting outside of it. Now you understand that God can't physically put himself inside of a little fishbowl. Right. So that's he that's why he's represented as Jesus and in, in, in that and why no man can go before the father because he's massive. Right. You know, this is only only the only yeah. person who goes to the father is he who came from the father. So what we see is on this earth is the actual manifestation or the the fingerprint of God in this earth the best way that he can. I always kind of liken it to like a little ant, uh, you know, like one of those little ant farms. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm standing outside of this ant farm, these ants have no concept of, of how big I am, how massive I am. And if I wanted to represent myself in there, I'd have to like make like a little ant figure and go in there and say, Hey, I'm the guy that's outside the, the cage. Yeah. Right? You know, <laughs> so it, yeah. it brings a bigger understanding to all this and understanding the Nephilim and all this kind of stuff. I mean, when it says, you know, that in these multiple heavens and all this other kind of stuff, like these layered, we, we understand that one is, you know, under the waters, one's above the waters. And then there's the, th or the, the waters in heaven where the stars are. And then where the father is above that. I mean, mm -hmm. we have this new, this key with the, 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 the releasing. And, and that was the biblical text of, or the, 
the uh, the text of Enoch literally says this was for the generation of the end. And we, I mean, we had lost the, uh, the Enochian text for probably 4,000 or not 4,000, four, four or 500 years. Right. I mean, I know that the right. Ethiopian Bible still, still carry that around, but it wasn't until we found these, uh, uh, you know, these vases with the, 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 the scrolls in them, you know, like that we didn't have a concept of this stuff was even out there or it was hidden from us. I mean, you know, right. honestly, so they didn't want us to, but, but in God's timing though, it's, he, he said that some of these textual documents, some of these understandings are going to come back to my people, you know, that they will, that knowledge will increase. They'll travel to and fro. These are all things that were told and, and prophesied for the end times. But when you read the first, I'm not, I'm, I'm not only condoning um, for the, for the most part, uh, Enoch one, Enoch two and three, um, somebody yeah. got a hold of those texts and they, you know, if they were even original in the first place, they're completely changed. They start getting into Metatron and all kinds of other crazy things that are Gnostic. Oh gosh, yes. So I, I stay away from those. But the first Enoch coincides with the Bible. It even calls, I mean, uh, Jesus calls himself the son of man. The first uh, recorded mm-hmm. time we have that would be in the book of Enoch and calling Jesus the son of man. So technically Jesus would be... Um, using a text from Enoch to describe himself. But um, there's a lot of stuff to me in, in Enoch one that, that coincides with the biblical text. And yeah. did you have something? Hey, to add? What, what do you think about uh, Daniel uh, 12 verse four? Cause I, I added this in, in crushing conceptualism, how it does kind of look like, uh, but thou, O Daniel shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. End shall be increased. Do you think that he is talking about the book of Enoch? I know we can definitely compare it, and it, it seems like it, especially when you look at Enoch chapter one, verses one and two. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very, I think it's very possible. I, I'll tell you an, another thing that I that I think that the, the audience may get a kick out of this too. Um, I also believe because currently we only have Greek um, translations of the. Uh, the, the revelation of John, right? We only have, and, and, and John was multifaceted. He, he knew several languages. Um, historically Hebrew, uh, if you were living at the time of Jesus, you knew three languages. It was Aramaic Greek, uh, mm. because that Aramaic was the, uh, the language of trade. Greek was the language of your, um, you know, the, the Romans who were, uh, occupying Israel yeah. at the time and Hebrew, because every Hebrew male needed to know that what the text of the Torah said. So they were, they were trilingual. And so the fact that we only have the revelation of John in, in Greek, uh, should say something because Greek is very difficult to try to translate the understanding of a lot of things, especially when it's metaphorical or it's in a, um, a sense of, uh, this represents something. Hebrew is beautiful for that. When we look at Daniel and, and like prophecies of the, the beasts and the animals. And we look at that in the Hebrew, uh-huh. it's beautiful how those words represent certain things. It's a lot more difficult when we have a Greek representation, but I'll tell you what, yeah. I believe that revelation was written in Hebrew first. And th- there's one thing that, that survived through that. And it's this, where it talks about, um, Abaddon. Okay. It says Ab or Apollyon. Uh, or his name is Abaddon in the Greek or no, it's Abaddon, but his name is Apollyon in the Greek. Why would a Greek text say that it's something else in the Greek? You know, you know what I'm saying? So it's a Greek text. It's written in a Greek text. That's saying that his name means something else in Greek. Oh yeah. So it was originally (laughs) written in something else. And then that Uh was added in there as in the Greek, he's also known as Apollyon. So we have a Greek text there, there has to be a Hebrew uh-huh. version of it out there that's somewhere. Neat. And it, it will, Ooh, it would open good. up our understanding so much. If we found a Hebrew version of a Hebrew written text of uh, revelation. Um, but I think, I think that may be something as well, but there may be, I think Enoch was, was, had a lot to do with it. Jubilees, Joshua. Um, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily, there are some contradictions, which we can argue were added text, rabbinical text. They were, you know, misconstrued, um, you know, translations. There's a lot of things, but there, I don't believe the Bible ever contradicts itself. I think it's our understanding that is the contradiction. And so there are contradictions that happen in some of those texts. We don't fully understand what, why those contradictions are there. So, you know, I don't, I don't wait, lay as much weight to Jubilees or Joshua. I look at them more as historical documents like Eusebius. 
Um, but mm-hmm. uh, Enoch, to me, I mean, it lines up with the divinity of Christ. It, it, it calls him his position, who he is. I don't see anything negative about first Enoch and it fills in and ties a lot of those gaps up that we're talking about. And, you know, if the Christian church had an understanding about um, the fallen angels and all that stuff before, you know, with that documentation, we wouldn't be in the boat that we're in today. Again, yeah. I say if the church taught love and relationship and the walk of the Messiah through observance and obedience to the father and not that you need to come to church, pay your tithe and, you know, eat your cracker <laughs> and your juice and yeah. you won't go to hell, we would have a drastically different Christianity today. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, man, this is draining my battery. My, my phone's about to die. <laughs> well, we're, we're an hour and 30 minutes in. I think we hit most of the bases on that. Um, and I want to continue on the, on with this. And, and this is just, like I said, this guys, this is the first part of an ongoing series. We're going to break down and we're going to talk about the character of uh, the Satans, right? We're going to talk about who the, right. the fallen watchers were, what their names mean. Um, we're going to look at uh, the parallels between them and pagan deities, um, there mm-hmm. are, because we see that there's symbology that, that, that kind of, uh, like the lightning bolt or whatever that, that seems to run yeah. down pagan mythology that ties to certain things. And we know these entities in the Hebrew and in, and in the Greek, they're represented by their characteristics. And so we want to go track each one of those down and we want to find out who Mastema is, who Balel is, who, uh, uh, Beelzebub is, what do they represent, right? What, what is their characteristics? Are they the same as Satan? Because I really, I I think most of us agree that Christianity, much like hell, has just broad swiped Satan and the adversary as being the bad guy, right? And I think this again has to do with the enemy. The enemy wants, he knows that there's other, you know, beings out there that are, that are, are harming mankind or or seek to destroy mankind. And he wants all of that attention focused on him. And I think that that we see this in, in Enoch where it's, where Azazel says, I fear that if we do this thing, I will get all the blame for it <laughs> because yeah, yeah. I think he's the one that got blamed for everything. So, all right guys, but yeah, it's been awesome. Uh, Andy, but before we cut out, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I've been talking. I've been trying to, God's been really pulling on me to do this. And man, I got a lot on my, on my, on my chest about it. I got a lot off tonight, but I thank you for, for coming in and, and putting your, your, uh, your, points and positions in there. Do you want to let everybody know what's the best way to get a hold of you, how to get your materials and uh, how to reach you? Well, uh, most people can find me on Facebook, Andrew Michael Denny. And uh, if you're in the chat and I'm, I'm not connected with you and you're on Facebook, look for me there. Um, I, I guess my ministry is uh, I, I, journalism. I wrote the book crushing conceptual conceptualism in modern Christianity. It's such a mouthful that I can't even pronounce it. Um, and you can find that on Amazon or my YouTube channel has a free PDF copy for anyone. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, I use my YouTube kind of more as a, as a hobby and I go over the topics in my book, but I mean, lately I've been thinking about growing it more. So if you're not subscribed, I will ask you to do that. Even if you don't want to watch the videos, just, uh, <laughs> hike up my number a little bit. Um, other than that, yeah, just, just get a hold of me on, on Facebook and, uh, let's be friends. I like connecting with like-minded people. Yeah. If you guys don't know, you'll, you'll see, uh, CC, CCMC. Is that, that's what it, or is it art builders now? Right. Um, arc builders, CCMC is my YouTube channel yeah, name. So you'll you'll um, see him in the chat from time to time. He comes in and, and visits yeah. and talks a lot on the, on the chat. So yeah yep. well, we thank we thank you for coming on guys and i hope you uh, you like this i hope you got something from this um if you mm-hmm. if you believe in this concept of hell and that kind of stuff maybe this gave you an opportunity to go search something out if i teach anything today is i'm teaching you and telling you to go read your bible right because all of this stuff the more you read the more you understand the more you know right then you can come back and you can say all right he had some good points let's let's go search it out right be bereans guys um, if you know anybody that maybe could benefit from this, make sure you share, send it out, send it to people who, um, who may find this interesting, right? 
Um, it helps us, uh, you know, get this channel going. Um, the more content that we have, the more stuff we put out, the more we're reaching people, the more we can direct them back to some of our other ministries and we can guide them and, and help them and get them a part of our fellowship and, and get them help that they need. So, um, yeah, guys, we thank you for coming on tonight. And if you guys like this show and you like this concept of decoding, uh, decoding the devil, uh, make sure you guys leave a comment and like in, in both, uh, the Facebook and the YouTube and, uh, I'll read your comments. All right, guys, thanks for sticking around for the show um, and the, the, the relaunching of the Decoding the Devil series um, here on Take on the World TV. I uh, appreciate you guys uh, being a part of this and being awesome in the chat and uh, all of our moderators um, and everybody who came in and commented. Make sure you guys stick around. We're, we're shooting for a seven to eight, maybe even nine with a QA and a uh, episode series um, as we go forward with this. We have three of them that we're already currently... Uh, uh, created the next one you guys will love because mama Samson makes her first appearance on sit rep. Um, and we are going to be talking about, this will be next week's show. We will be talking about, uh, let's see, it was principalities, powers, and spirits of wickedness will be next week's show. So make sure you guys, uh, jump on here next, next Wednesday, uh, 9 PM. And, uh, I'm hoping I'm going to be out of town. So I'm hoping that I can fire this up from the show. If it doesn't happen next, next Wednesday, it will happen the following after when I get back from town or back from out of town. So we're shooting for next Wednesday. I'm going to try to make it work, but hang, hang with us guys. Um, but thank you guys again for tuning in the show. Make sure you guys are like, uh, subscribing. If you're not subscribed to take on the world TV and, uh, make sure, make sure you guys are commenting and, and sharing this out so we can get this word out here. Um, this series, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all in for it. I, I'm absolutely ready to get this completed. Um, cause it's been like this nagging thing that, that, you know, God's been like, I want you to get this going. I want you to get this going. So I think we're going to hit and touch on a lot of really cool things and, uh, going to kind of open and expand our understanding on a true biblical understanding of studying the enemy versus, you know, just delving into everything of the world and finding the devil behind every doorstep. So guys, Thank you again for watching the show. We'll see you guys hopefully next week. May God bless and keep you guys. Have a wonderful evening.